Hey listeners, if you like this podcast, check out our other shows, The Study Table and Training Table. Listen to archived content and in-depth interviews with insiders working with student athletes. It's on our website, www.fredopi.com. Welcome to The Dinner Table, a discussion with food as a lens into cultures and societies. I'm your host, Fred Opie. On today's show, Fred answers questions about his latest book, Zora Neale Hurston on Florida Food, Recipes, Remedies, and Simple Pleasures. Fred talks about barbecue, juke joints, and how he got interested in food while cooking for himself in college. Enjoy the show. So while we're waiting for the slides to come up, um, I had my two children, one is 10 and one is 13, go through the book and pull out some passages they thought would be good to share with you all. So I thought that would be interesting. I had no idea what they're gonna pick. Uh, They just opened it up and looked through some, "Mm, this looks interesting, Dad. And so I'm I'm gonna share, do some readings from that. How many people here know about Zora Neale Hurston, what you're familiar with. What do you know about Zora? Can give, give us the, the, the elevator pitch. Zora was? She was, she was a woman ahead of her time. She, um, I'm familiar with her because I recommended to my book group that they read And Their Eyes Were Watching God. Probably her most noted, her most noted book, Their Eyes Were Watching God. Really had a very nice discussion, we loved it. So there's a couple things that you commented on that I think are apropos to describe Zora. Definitely a woman ahead of her time. Uh, She was one of those people who transcended the time period that she lived in. I think it explains why her work is still relevant today and why people are still reading it, and not only in the academy, but outside the academy. And as as you described, in book clubs, it's often used in book clubs. And I begin to use it in in my courses uh, to talk about history. And then later on, to talk about food history. The other thing about Zora is she definitely was an intellectual, but she was a, what I would call a popular intellectual. A lot of her work focused on common people. She studied the rough and the ready people. Uh, She spent a lot of her time doing field work during the Great Depression. She worked as a WPA writer. She was a contemporary of uh, William Faulkner. Faulkner's from Mississippi. She's also a southerner, but from the state of Florida. She grew up in an all-black township, the oldest all-black township in the United States. So during the height of Jim Crow and Jim Crow segregation, she wasn't exposed to it at all because the people who ran and operated her town, the sheriff, the mayor, all of them were African-American. So it was a very different scenario for her than what other people experienced in the South. One thing's interesting about the raising of pigs that she described in her own life is uh, people who raised pigs didn't keep them in any confined area. They just let them roam because they'll eat any and everything. So it was very inexpensive just to let them roam. The problem with that is often your pig that was roaming ended up on somebody's barbecue pit. So here's a, uh, a barbecue pit. Every state has its definition of barbecue. And I know it's kind of crushing for some of us that grow up and we had these little uh, hibachi grills and we think we're barbecuing. That is not barbecue. Let me read, making the pit. Hurston's writing and sources from the same period show us that the method of barbecuing at whole hog has not changed in centuries. In Eatonville, in the Eatonville community barbecue scene in the novel, Their Eyes Are Watching Guy, Hambo and Pearson, these are two community members, dug a big hole in the back of the store. Now, this is a quote from a 1932 article. A good barbecue pit should be approximately 10 feet long and nine feet wide and and three to four feet deep. So the time it actually took to do these barbecues was an all day affair, according to a 1931 article on Southern barbecue. Similarly, other sources describe pit barbecue in the areas Hurston studied and from where immigrants came to those places as laborers. As a Work Progress Administration record, that's the WPA, uh, shows us, digging a pit some six feet long and possibly two feet deep. So again, that's typical, whether it's Arkansas, whether it's Florida, whether it's South Carolina. Now, what will differ in barbecue is is actually what you do. What you barbecue differs. Uh, Typically in Florida, barbecue means a whole hog. In Texas, you don't put sauce in a barbecue. 
and they're going to serve it to you like that. In Florida, barbecue sauces are typically tomato based. Okay, now there are parts of the South where the barbecue sauce, listen carefully what I'm going to say, you don't get grossed out until you try it, is mayonnaise based. Parts of South Carolina is mustard based. What's the meaning of barbecue? Barbecue is, for many people, it just means a special occasion. It's not so much what you're eating. Another definition of barbecue for many people is eating outdoors. There's a whole chapter in the book on barbecue with barbecue sauces. There's the sauce that you put on, and then there's the sauce you cook the barbecue meat with, the basting sauce, where you literally have a bucket full of the basting sauce, be vinegar based, be a little lemon, hot pepper, and you have a mop that is used strictly for barbecue, one of those white mops, and you just stick that bad boy in there and you just, every couple of hours, I, I have a, a, a smoker at my house, so I love to do that process. I actually have one of the rolls you use when you wanna to try to hit a fine spot on a wall, that's my barbecue basting thing. It's used, we don't use it for anything else but basting. But those are the kind of things that you will see uh, people do. So there's the basting, and then when it's done, there's the barbecue sauce. So all those different recipes are actually in the book. It's a segregated South. However, your barbecue guy, your cook, more than likely in Florida, it's gonna be an African-American. And you get a reputation for being the barbecue person, and you make big money going around doing barbecue to barbecue. Again, this is an all night affair. It's one of those things where you start the fire maybe at uh, eight o'clock at night and the meat goes on maybe about 12 and you're turning the meat and you're basting the meat all morning long until the food is served around 11 to 12 the next day. And you're getting paid big money for doing this. So it's, it's a very interesting skill to talk about the pit masters and how revered they are in many cultures and, and societies. This is a political barbecue, where politicians will host a barbecue and everybody comes and eats for free. And it's one of the reasons you're coming is to be persuaded to vote for that person. This is quite common around the South. These are, these are big public events where you see politicians show up. And they're often one of the few events in the South during Jim Crow that are integrated. This is one candidate running for governor. Now, it could be the incumbent, but the whole party is behind the candidate, so they have the ability to finance this. We'll be right back. For more interviews and related content, you can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, and other podcast distributors. Also, check out our website at www.fredopi.com. Ask questions on Facebook at Frederick Douglass Opie and on Twitter at Dr. Fred D. Opie. For information about advertising on the show, please email us at fdopie at gmail.com. That's fdopie at gmail.com. If you like the show, check out the episode entitled Food and Music on the Chitlin Circuit, which includes Fred's appearance on the Splendid Table. You, you see that the term soul is so much related to the chitlin circuit and people who made the best they could out of the opportunities they had, whether it be uh, spaces to play their music, places to eat food, or places to perform when nobody else would have them. So it's this whole ideal of uh, surviving with dignity in the midst of very precarious situations. Now back to the show. A passage in the book about sawmill camps. It became customary in southern sawmill towns in turpentine camps for a juke that sold barbecue. That's a juke joint. How many of you remember seeing the movie The Color Purple? And remember Harpo. Harpo has that little juke joint where the fight breaks out. All right, it looks like it's about to fall down. Those are quite common uh, African American owned and operated uh, institutions where music, Food and liquor were at the center of those businesses. And it was those one day off that laborers got an opportunity, they would go down and do that. So it became customary in Southern Sawmill towns and turpentine camps for a juke that sold barbecue to serve as a place of entertainment for men to unwind. Black entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs owned these jukes, sometimes spelled jukes, J O O K S, or J U K E S. J -U -K -E -S. In the segregated South, we provided a place for laborers to eat their daily meals. Quote, the grilled chicken, spare ribs, spicy pork, and whole range of smoky barbecue meat cooked so well on these places 
are a continuum of the cooking that males did, beginning with those on the plantation, whereas the anthropologists and niche. Traditionally, we talk about gendering of cooking. The outdoor cooking is done by men. Why? I don't know. That's one thing you will notice with barbecue. You will hardly ever see a woman running the barbecue, basting the meat, cooking the meat. Now, they may serve it, slice it up, but it's usually the sweets, that is the baked goods that are at a barbecue or a picnic that are gendered towards women. And it's one of those things that's been going on all the way back to the time period that we're talking here, which the book covers 1898 until roughly the 1940s and 50s. Some questions. She was often criticized by her peers, people like Richard Wright, for writing in the Negro dialect. He didn't like that. A lot of, of, of scholars of the Harlem Renaissance period, their, their emphasis was we need to publish work that would make African Americans look the best to the general population. Her belief was we need to show all aspects of African American culture and life, good, bad, and indifferent. She got along better with men than she did with women. She had a lot of brothers, and that might have been part of it. And she was the younger of the siblings. She had a brother that went on to be a doctor. She had a brother that went on to be a butcher. What are the roots of my passion uh, with food history? I'm one, I'm the youngest of three. My mom worked outside the house. My dad, uh, he was a Sing Sing prison guard. He worked overtime probably four out of four to five days out of the week. His shift was started at three o'clock. If you worked overtime, when I'm getting ready to leave to go to school, he's just getting in and going to sleep to wake up for his three o'clock shift. When I'm coming over at three o'clock, he's going to work. So both of them were out the house. And because of that, all three of us learned how to cook really well. So one side of the family is from North Carolina, the other side is from Virginia, born and raised in, in the South. So when you went to their house, even though I, bought, I grew up in the Hudson Valley, I was exposed to a lot of this food that that's the only time I actually ate it, when I was there at their houses. So that probably is the genesis of it, then cooking for myself. Now, I think everything probably increased in my interest in cooking and love of cooking is when I went to, off to college. I went to a community college, a Herkimer County Community College in the Mohawk Valley. There were no dorms. Every student who was there were calling back home to grandmothers and mothers trying to find out how to make this recipe to cook. Not only that, but how to take this very small stipend that we had and stretch it. You know, so what cuts of meat do you buy? What kind of vegetables do you buy? So if there were all these things I learned during that process. And I think in grad school, I got really turned on to NPR. So my routine would be from a very stressful day of cramming all the stuff in my head is I would go home, turn on NPR and start cooking. So cooking for me became a part of the educational process, but it also became associated with relaxing. Probably the easiest book for me to ever write. And I wrote it in a short amount of time. Usually when you're writing a book, it takes about five years, and by the time you get to the end of it, you don't want to see it again. So, but this book is, hasn't been like that. She's taken down stories about, like there's a chapter in the book called Food Pharmacy, where she had a lot of stomach problems herself. And so she began to collect the stories of the natural remedies that these workers had learned from their ancestors. And she wrote them down to the point, they were almost written like recipes enough to do a whole chapter. So she's engaging in, in the things she finds interesting. She loves to cook herself. So she had a real good sense of this. She kept her own garden. There's the stories in her own letters where she talks about her garden, when she's eating from her garden. So I don't think she ever sat, sat down and said, this is what I'm going to do. It was just a... Same way she, I could probably, you could, you could definitely do a whole book on Zorna Hurston and, and music because she, she does that as well. She's copying down what she considers to be another important part of African American culture, and that's the musical legacy. She does a whole thing about religion. She studies all kinds of aspects of traditional religion, uh, Christianity. She goes to the Caribbean, she does voodoo. She spends time in Jamaica, time in Haiti. So she's, she does a number of things. I just, with my food on the braid in mind, just locked into that and like a horse in the park, went like this and said, only look at the food. And, and I don't really spend too much time in general in my work talking about beverages. And a lot of people would ask me, well, what about, you know, other than the moonshine, because it was so important part, uh, I really don't talk a whole lot about beverages. I wonder if one could do the same thing, just looking at beverages and what they learn, what we learn from that. The recipes in the book are from the time period. 
So if you see a sweet potato pie recipe, it's probably from anywhere of 1900 to 1940. If you see a collard green recipe, which there is, it's going to be from that time period. So I went into historical newspapers, and, and, and many of these were African American owned and operated newspapers, and I pulled the recipes from there, whether it's barbecue or whatever it is. The cornbread recipe that you see in there, um, there are a number of recipes, but they're really from the time period. And there's something to be said about recipes as a historical document that that's one of the things that I include in, in my work. My next book that's coming out, it's, uh, it's called uh, Feeding the Revolution, the Role of Food in Social Movements. So I will look at the civil rights movements and I will look at them through the lens of food and, and what food played. I also, in that book, um, the last chapter, the afterword, is on Occupy Wall Street that happened, that whole protest movement. I went down to Occupy Wall Street and did uh, several interviews with members of the food committee to find out how they were maintaining this movement and feeding people and learn the tradition that they brought in and made a part of Occupy Wall Street and it became a template for other Occupy um, scenarios around the country, including here in Boston. So those are, those are the kind of things I do. And again, when I do that work, I'm looking at the recipes from that time period. One of the workers on its food committee uh, at Occupy Wall Street sp spent time up in, I think it was in Maine, the area where they built the nuclear plant, uh, nuclear submarine plant. And there was a long protest that happened there. I think it's uh, late 60s, early 70s. And they took over the, took over the site where they were gonna build this new uh, nuclear plant. And so I interviewed people about it, and then I found recipes because they talked about the same thing. In order to have that kind of a long protest, you gotta be able to feed the people involved there. Can you imagine staying in a place for three or four days and protesting and having nothing to eat? So I talk about that and find related recipes from the time period and include that in the book. Thank you for listening, I appreciate you coming out. Check out our podcast archives, suggest show topics, and advertise on the show. And to book me as a guest and or speaker, visit our website, www.fredopi.com. That's www.fredopi.com. For information about advertising on the show, please email us at fdopie at gmail.com. That's fdopie at gmail.com Thanks for listening and be good.